My name is Ian Stocks. I'm a taxonomic entomologist with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, the groups that I'm responsible for are the, the scales, mealybugs and their relatives, and the allorotidae, which are the white flies. In this part of the training on Cocoidea, we'll discuss the armored scale-like families, including the family Conchospididae, the false armored scales, and the Diaspididae, the true armored scales. The Conchospididae, there are about 30 species worldwide. Uh, the majority of them, 27, are in the single genus Conchaspis, which is primarily neotropical in distribution. They resemble armored scales in that they produce a thick wax cover, but differ in that the exuviae are not incorporated into the cover. The shape is round to oval, generally, and often they form a volcano-type uh, shape uh, with radiating ridges, especially in the earlier stages seen here at the bottom. Females generally have uh, fully developed legs, antennae, and eyes. And the species-level diagnosis is generally based on the distribution of pores and ducts and other characters. And they are, in fact, not particularly closely related to the armored scales. Sort of briefly go over a couple of the major characters of an adult female uh, conchospitid, in this case, Conchaspis angracii, a species found in Florida. As you can see, the antennae are reasonably well developed. Uh, the eye uh, is prominent on the margin. The legs are all fully developed. Uh, in this case, though, there is a, a little bit of reduction with the tibia and the tarsus fused. A couple of the uh, characters uh, unique to them include the ocellar spot, which is a modification of the cuticle found just above the tentorial structures in the head. They also have something called the metasternal sclerotization, which is a circular boss found just posterior to the uh, hind leg. Like the armored scales, the posterior segments of the abdomen are consolidated into a structure known as the pygidium. And this is where structures like the uh, uh, general opening, the anal opening, and a uh, number of uh, pore types are found. In this illustration here, we can see an electron micrograph of one of the multilocular pores on the abdomen of the uh, conscious spitted, each one of these chambers here being responsible for production of a little bit of wax. So now we'll move on to the armored scale family, the diaspididae, which is a much larger and economically more important family. Worldwide in distribution, uh, it's probably the largest family of Cocoidea. Currently it has about 2,400 species, uh, but there are probably uh, large numbers of species uh, still undiscovered and, and therefore undescribed, and probably a large number of species that uh, exist in cryptic species complexes. Armored scales pose a high risk for transport and introduction, uh, primarily because of their small size, but also because they're cryptic, especially under their cover, which may blend in uh, with the substrate. And they also can be hidden uh, in various places on a plant that can, that can make them hard to find uh, during inspections. The adult female is characterized with the loss of many insect uh, structures that would be typically found in an adult, such as the antennae, the eyes, legs, and abdominal spiracles. But they are also known for the development of numerous specialized structures. For instance, the scale, uh, the scale itself, which covers the body and incorporates uh, the exuvi or shed skin of earlier instars, uh, a, diverse, uh, a diverse type of, of secretory pores and ducts, and at the terminus of the abdomen, uh, lobes for manipulating secretions into the scale cover and a very well-developed pygidial area, which is where the posterior segments, including the anus and vulva, pores and ducts, are consolidated into what is more or less a single unitary structure separated from the uh, abdomen. This slide has a number of pictures of the scale covers of various species of, of armored scales. As you can see, they vary from uh, approximately circular to uh, oval to elongated uh, to very elongated. They also vary in color and the degree to which you can maybe see through the cover, for instance, a completely opaque, uh, to more or less see through, as in figure six, where you can see the adult female below the scale cover. In example number four, Pseudolacaspis pentagona, this is the scale cover itself. And below, in figure five, the adult female below, if the scale is actually removed from the cover, and in this case, you can actually see the pygidium uh, very distinct, sclerotized, and set off from the rest of the body. 
So we'll discuss a little bit the uh, morphology of the scale cover itself. Roughly speaking, there are two types, what we call the diaspidine type and the aspidiotine type. The diaspidine type is typically more elongated. And as the scale develops, you'll see that the, first, uh, uh, the, the, the skin of the first instar here at the beginning, the skin and wax produced by the second instar here, and then the remainder and largest part of the scale cover is the wax produced by the adult female. And these are all attached and affixed to the leaf surface. For the aspidiotine type, we have something similar. The exuviae and wax of the first and second instars are in this region. And then the remainder of the wax made by the female is laid down in a more or less circular pattern forming the general circular outline of this type of scale. If you flipped this scale over, what you would see is the ventral surface here. These are the exuviae. And collected in here are eggs. This is the adult female still affixed to the surface of the leaf. More eggs. And a little bit of the wax produced on the ventral surface of the scale and adhering to the leaf surface. So now we'll discuss some of the morphology of scale insects and how that relates to diagnosis. As with the other groups we've discussed, uh, your start in diagnosis will begin with examination of, of what you hope is, is a well-prepared slide. And you'll use that in, con uh, in conjunction with typical line art illustrations that occur uh, in keys and diagnosis. The scale off to the left here in the uh, color image is an aspidiotine type. Uh, you can see here the pygidium circled and set off in the rest of the body. These are the mouth parts here. And in this one, you can actually see the uh, body of the crawler stage still inside the body of the female. So you would compare that to line art illustrations uh, in, in published descriptions. As with mealybugs and soft scales, the convention is to have the general outline of the insect bisected into a left and right half, with the left half showing uh, characters of the dorsal side and the right half showing characters found on the ventral side. Surrounding the outline of the image are uh, call-out illustrations of the relevant uh, micromorphological features um, uh, as they exist that are uh, perhaps peculiar uh, to that species. So the first piece of morphology we'll discuss are the spiracles and structures associated with them. In the anterior of the body, the most prominent structures are the head and mouth part structures, and then one or two pairs of spiracles, the anterior and posterior pair. Uh, both pairs can be present, or in some cases, the posterior pair may be absent. One of the more important characters associated with these spiracles is the uh, cluster of pores known as the perispiracular pores. They don't occur in all species, but when they occur, uh, they can be uh, distributed around the anterior spiracle, around the posterior spiracle, or the anterior spiracle only. So these pore-like structures, which are responsible for secreting wax and keeping the opening of the atrium, uh, the opening of the spiracle, the atrium clear, uh, so air can move to and uh, uh, in and out. Uh, the pores uh, vary in their number and position, and all of that is taxonomically important information. In the posterior of a slide-mounted uh, armored scale, the most, most important characters are uh, generally found on the pygidium, which we discussed earlier. So this is a general shot of a uh, prepared pygidium, and we'll dis discuss some of the characters here in general overview. Uh, we can find perivulvar pores here. A good landmark character is the anal opening, which is usually represented by a clear spot just anterior to the very terminus of the abdomen. The long, thin structures uh, seen inside of the body cavity are ducts of various types and their corresponding openings, seen here, for instance. Projecting from the margin are structures like gland spines, gland tubercles, and plates. And very important taxonomically is the presence, absence, and when present, the type of development of the lobe structures. These are sclerotized projections of various morphology. And there's the median pair here, or the first lobe. This is the second lobe, third lobe. The number uh, can vary significantly. From uh, in some, a few cases, there are zero lobes, uh, and but the most common is 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 one, two, or three lobes. 
And in some cases, the lobes can be uh, diminished to the point where, in the extreme, they're, ab they're completely gone. Uh, but also, they can be, pres uh, be present as uh, sclerotized projections. This region in here is known as the interlobular space. And characters uh, present there, such as CD or the opening of ducts, are also taxonomically important. Also present in the pygidium are structures known as paraphyses or paraphyses. These are not present in all species. And generally described, they are heavily sclerotized, elongated lobes. Uh, their taxonomic use is in uh, counting the number of them that are present and the relative length of uh, the paraphyses. So for instance, there's a short one here, long, short, short, long. But that formula may differ uh, among species, and that's taxonomically important. So this is a good example here of, of how sclerotized these uh, paraphyses are. Uh, and you can see that they're usually found uh, in close proximity to duct openings. Perivalvar pores are structures restricted to the adult female stage. Not all uh, adult female species will have these, but if they are present, then uh, by definition it will be an adult, even if the defining character of the adult stage, the presence of a vulva, uh, is, uh, is, is less clear. Uh, the number of clusters is variable, and the number of pores within each cluster is also variable. The most common complement, though, is to have two paired clusters, such as here and here, with one cluster anterior to the anal opening or vulva. So again, for general landmark purposes, this is the anal opening here. Here's the anal opening, the cluster of perivulvar pores. So there's five clusters. Here's the vulva here. And an extreme close-up, these are the groups. And here's the vulva again right here. Cuticular structures known as plates are also present on the pygidium, and they project from the, the margin. Uh, these are associated with ducts. Uh, the micromorphology is tremendously variable, but often you'll find them in a condition known as fimbriate. Uh, so this is a line of fimbriate plates here. And if you get a very detailed close-up, the plates and the fimbriae are here. And we call each one of these tines. So the number and pattern of branching in those tines uh, are all taxonomically important. As I mentioned, these are associated with ducts. For instance, in this picture here, uh, right here and here, are the duct openings. And also in this illustration here, we can uh, find more morphology. Again, if we anchor ourselves in the uh, reference for the anal opening right here, we find part of the cluster of perivulvar pores, duct structures here. And again, we can track the lobes, L1, L2, L3. And in this case, these plates, which are present between the first lobe, the first and second lobe, and the second and third. This is the interlobular space with uh, fimbriate plates. I've mentioned in several slides already uh, ducts. Uh, the most important are the barred ducts. Uh, there are two major varieties, the two-barred and the one-barred duct. These are variable in number, uh, length, and distribution over the dorsum and venter of the animal. The one-barred uh, duct type is often very long, many, many, many times uh, longer than its width. And frequently, the two-barred are short. Um, so they're more squat, though this is a very variable character. And in some species, the two-barred ducts can actually be many times as long as their width as well. Uh, especially prominent in the two-barred variety is uh, their formation of a duct orifice, uh, which will um, be quite obvious on the cuticle of a mounted specimen. And the pattern that these duct openings, these duct orifice uh, structures form is uh, taxonomically very useful. A little bit more detailed discussion on lobes. Typically, there's one to four pairs. Uh, they become smaller as you go from the posterior most pair uh, and then further uh, towards the anterior. Uh, the median lobes uh, can vary in the condition of, of how they join in the midline. And if they are joined, they are called zygotic though this is a uh, species level character, so this is a zygotic 
lobe here, and this would be the non-zygotic condition. So this character will often appear in keys. When you get to the second and third lobes, uh, they may be uh, present either as a single structure or as a paired structure. If it's single, we refer to it as a lobe. But in this case, for instance, the second lobe is what we call bilobulate. It is made up of two discrete uh, subparts. And in this illustration here, we can see paraphyses uh, uh, projecting inwards from the base of each of the lobules. In this species, uh, the median lobe is characterized by having a very asymmetric margin. So the length here is short, and the length here is quite long. So those ratios can be important in species level determination, as is the character of uh, serrations or teeth-like structures along the margin. We can also see in this picture uh, gland spines and the ducts associated with them. And here's some micro duct pore openings here. In this picture again, we have the first, second, third, and fourth lobe. The first lobe is notched. There's a median and lateral notch, and it's symmetrical. Uh, but it can be asymmetrical. So I briefly just want to go over uh, a case study um, uh, at the end of this uh, presentation to give you a little bit of context for the importance of these micromorphological characters. Um, this is the cycad scale, Olacaspis yasumatsui, uh, known as the uh, Asian cycad scale. The species is native to cycad forests of Asia, but was discovered in Florida around the late 90s and over the past 15 years has become a major pest, especially of the very popular ornamental plant Cycus revoluta, of um, the sago palm. The scale cover is almost identical to that of uh, a very common uh, and uh, long established scale in Florida, the white magnolia scale, Pseudolacaspis cockerelli. Uh, this similarity can cause problems uh, because if you don't examine the animal beneath the cover, uh, then it's going to take you longer perhaps to realize that another species of scale uh, has become established. And you might have just thought, well, it's just uh, perhaps becoming, for some reason, more common on a new host. Because uh, Pseudolacaspis cockerelli also occurred at low numbers, occasionally on Cycats revoluta. So this is an adult female CAS here. And these are the pupae of males. And in general, this scale, is almost ident this scale cover is almost identical to that of the white magnolia scale. If the female is... Uh, flipped out of that cover. Uh, she does show a general kind of uh, semblance, uh, resemblance to uh, that of the white magnolia scale. With uh, practice, though, you can tell, uh, at, even at this level, uh, what significant differences there are. So this is the adult female here, eggs, uh, male pupa here. However, it really requires that the, 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 uh, the females be uh, processed and slide mounted and uh, examined uh, under high magnification to get a real appreciation for the differences in the micromorphology that distinguish these two species. For instance, the condition of the median lobes is quite different. The shape, uh, the distribution of these major two-barred ducts in the pygidium uh, is different. And the distribution of other things like microducts and other structures uh, readily distinguishes these two as slide-mounted specimens. But it just goes to show you how important those characters are where by uh, just sort of cursory examination of the adult stage under the scale, uh, they might appear to be uh, the same thing. This presentation has been the product of uh, the interaction between a number of uh, people and institutions that collaborated. Uh, these are listed on this slide. And at this point, I'll take any questions you may have. In armored scales, can the cover be used for identification? So the uh, color and shape of the uh, uh, adult female cover can't always be used. Uh, if you know what the limitations are in the fauna, you can maybe narrow it down. Um, but it, you know, it can be used um, with some significance at the level of genus, for instance. But at the species level, uh, no. You can't rely on that for species ID. 
I mounted an armored scale and when I examined it, it had a cover-like thing on it. What, what is that? Uh, there are a group of genera in the uh, armored scale family that uh, even as an adult female, once they're removed from the cover that they've made, actually reside inside of another type of cover, which is actually the cast skin of the uh, penultimate stage. And these are called pupillarial uh, uh, armored scales. So you actually have to do, uh, make a, a bit of a special effort to dissect from that um, uh, pupillarial cover the adult female inside in order to get the appropriate mount. Otherwise, the specimen that you want to look at will be obscured um, by the pupillarial cover that it's still in.